For government to get itself in shape, now might be the time. And so who better to tell us how we can do that here in Washington State than Brian Sontag, Washington State Auditor, right here on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmert. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Stan. Good to be back. Uh, and it is a big topic that we're talking about, getting, getting government in shape, uh, because it's had to reform itself lately, huh? I, I think that's, uh, that's a continuous thing. I think uh, government, whether you know, the, the financial times are, are good or, or not so good, government should always be about the business of uh, resizing, reforming, uh, reinventing itself uh, whenever needed. By the way, the, the uh, State Auditor's website is really informative. You're going to want to go there. It's uh, www.sao.wa.gov. We've got it up on the screen, and that will be great. And I wanted to go to what looks like the mission statement. Mm. And I was talking before, and it says so much in a very short period of time. Here's what it says. The State Auditor's Office independently serves the citizens of Washington by promoting accountability, fiscal integrity, and openness in state and local government. Working with these governments and with the citizens, we strive to ensure the efficient and effective use of public resources. Wow. Let's break that down. Mm -hmm. Independently serving the citizens. How can you be independent when you are a popularly elected official? I think that's exactly what makes us independent. Uh, the fact that the founders of the state didn't like or trust government very much, and they put the office of state auditor right smack in the state constitution, made it a constitutional office, made it a statewide elected office, means I don't work for uh, the, the legislature or the governor. I work directly for the people of this state. We're their public auditor, not another government finance shop, and I think that sets us up to be a, um, amazingly independent. So how do you, and then how does the office itself uh, handle it when you've got the governor wanting to do one thing and the legislature wanting to do something different in case that it were to ever happen? And I suspect it probably does. It has. And right in the middle, they're both pulling at you and saying, help me. Well, if, if they're pulling us in, in opposite directions, uh, that can be a pretty easy call because we're not, we're not part of the legislative branch. You know, while I, I don't work for the governor, we are part of the executive or administrative branch of state government. But uh, the legislature has its own uh, audit function. They have a joint legislative audit committee, and they can do a lot of the audit work there. Um, we're going to be as helpful and cooperative as we can be, either to the governor's office, any other state agency, another elected official, or to the legislature and, and that specific branch. So we do interact with them quite a bit. Uh, the next part is by promoting accountability, fiscal integrity, and openness in state and local government. That's huge in and of itself, and we are going to, that's is basically the whole show, is it, how you do that. Well, it is. You know, there's, uh, there is only one issue for the Office of State Auditor, and that's accountability. Um, I define that as government being open and accessible, responsive, responsible, and a, a government that listens to people and when it talks to them, tells them the truth. And so when, when we get into uh, government being open, the more open and accessible government can be, the more responsive it is to citizens, the fewer other problems they have. If they're open, if they're responsive, they're going to be about wanting to uh, meet the needs of citizens and respond to any issues we might bring up and, uh, and correct things. Well, but for the most part, though, when, when we all hear the word, uh-oh, there's an audit coming, mm -hmm. we get scared. Sure. Um, and I, I would think since people in, inside government and, and manager, whether they're managers or popularly elected officials, they're just people. So they're going to get scared too. Sure. Um, are you a plus for them even though they're scared? Yeah, it, it's a plus um, because it's not, uh, it's not about them. Uh, we're auditing their stewardship over public funds and we're reporting our work to the public. Uh, the word public gets in there a lot because that's the operative word. Um, I spent 20 years in county government in, in Pierce County before I was elected to this office. I held two different elected offices um, at the county level. I was audited by the state auditor's office during those years. And while that wasn't always a pleasant experience, it, it did provide, I think, a very healthy perspective for me on 
not just the historic role of this office, but what it can be. And we're not just about gotcha or finding what went wrong or who screwed something up. Um, our goal, our ultimate goal, is to help governments improve their service delivery to the citizens across the state. But don't you and some of the people in, in your office though sometimes feel like uh, you get the, the Dan Rather reception of, you know, of 60 minutes, uh oh, this guy is here to, to yep. get me. Sure. I mean, I mean, for the most part, uh, I, I would not blame anyone in local government if they figure that we're there to do just a few things. Find whatever it is they did wrong, get it printed on the front page of their local paper so they don't get reelected. Now that is not our goal, but that uh, that sometimes is the position we're starting from in other people's minds. Okay, but we're well, aware of that. Let's go to the website itself. Uh, it, first off, we're going to go to can we help you find something and are you, and then you've got a, a whole uh, different uh, litany of things. And I want to mm -hmm. focus right now on a state employee reporting improper governmental action, yeah. basically the whistleblower. Yes. Um, do you get, I mean, do you get a, a people inside government saying, you know, uh, hey, state auditor, you need to check this out? All the time. Uh, this office has been administering the State Employee Whistleblower Act uh, since 1982. Now, I've been in this office since 1993, and we campaigned on a few things. One was to uh, increase and improve the rights and protections of government whistleblowers, which I think mm -hmm. is essential. I'll give you one one of the most recent examples we had from a frontline state employee reporting directly to us, independently to us, something they found. Uh, this was a, um, a project uh, for the Department of Transportation on Highway 18, uh, a widening project. Mm -hmm. it took five years. Uh, the original contract that was let was for $54.5 million. The final price was just under $100 million. And during that period of time, there were 156 change orders um, to that project. Um, change orders and requests that were approved, not scrutinized or, or thoughtfully um, decisions made on, but just approved, blanket approval, write the checks, spend the money. And uh, what we were able to find from that, from this employee bringing that information to us, was uh, an agency, a program, a system that did not um, did not have good controls in place, didn't monitor their contracts, and didn't oversee that public work. That's a lot of money, and it's just one example. Yeah, we actually had that. We were going to talk about that because oh. the you in there it says the report found that the project originally bid at 55.9 million grew to 98.5 million, mm -hmm. and change orders totaled 16.4 million, and environmental violations cost another. 4.5 million, so right. we're talking about double the amount. Sure. You know, and if I'm a member of the public, I'm $28 doing... $28 million per mile to widen that stretch on Highway 18 is what oh it came gosh. down to. But, but if I'm a member of the public, really, I'm pounding on the table, I'm saying somebody's got to get fired because of that. Yeah, well, we don't get into any of the enforcement part. You're and, not in HR, huh? <laughs> no, and, uh, and, and I guess the, the auditor shouldn't, but um, quite often, uh, that kind of action does take place, where uh, that kind of follow-up does exist, but that's for agency and department managers. Something I was really interested in is, is on the website, actually, if you go to it, it's a, the whistleblower designees in Washington State Agency. So you pick a state agency, and, and if you're a state employee, that's, that's going to identify who you go talk to? Mm -hmm. Wow. State law requires that that person be uh, appointed and named in each state agency so those employees know where to go and, and take that information. The very first thing in the whistleblower program, and though in terms of a standard, is there has to be a finding of a, or there needs to be a gross waste of public funds mm -hmm. or resources. Okay, what's the difference between gross waste and just average waste? You know, we don't, we don't necessarily try to even define that. Um, if we think it's of enough public interest, if we think it's of enough uh, of an example to be able to share with that state agency and other agencies so they can put better controls in place, safeguarding public uh, money and assets, then we're going to follow up on it. Do state employees feel protected so that they can come to the state auditor's office through the whistleblower program and not be found out? I hope they do. Um, and, and I think there's always going to be examples of uh, um, identity that, that does get uh, 
found out, does get released. It's not going to come from our agency, but you know, for the most part, employees know um, who's doing what and who's saying what. The State Department of uh, um, the state agency that's responsible for that uh, has not found any instances of, of retaliation. No, well, that's good. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Yeah. But, <laughs> So uh, we try to make sure that we work very hard on behalf of those state employees and provide those protections. Citizens also can be involved in yeah. whistleblowing. Yeah, not a formal process, but we want to hear directly from citizens, and we do all the time. So, I mean, is it common for you to get a complaint from a citizen saying, you know, there's, there's a road crew out there, there's 14 people watching and one person working? I mean, you know, kind of that old joke type thing? Sure. We get those. Um, those kinds of uh, suggestions or, or instances will probably refer directly to that county or city or school district, or the local government uh, responsible. But we'll, uh, we'll get information that comes to us that uh, maybe it alerts us directly to a fraud. Maybe it's the kind of issue that uh, we're just going to refer to our, our local audit team to follow up in their next routine audit. We have uh, teams of auditors in 14 cities around the state. so. We have people in, in communities all around Washington to respond to these things. How do you get funded? Uh, less and less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in fact, uh, the, this most recent budget process, we were, uh, our office was cut an additional $8 million after a 22% reduction in the, the previous biennium. So, you know, we're, we're faced with doing less and less all the time, too, and trying to work smarter mm -hmm. and be more creative. So you... Your agency has a review um, function, but you, ha you don't have teeth. You don't have punishment function, right? Correct. We have no enforcement authority. Uh, the best enforcement tool we have is the public light of day. So uh, when we set out originally to um, increase or improve the, the visibility of this office, um, thereby shining a, a bright light on the credibility of the work we do, that uh, results in significant change. Now, is the whistleblower program protect uh, local government people too? No, that's uh, there's a, a separate uh, local government whistleblower statute, which uh, I really don't think is very effective at all. It's uh, run county by county, and uh, it's really up to those entities to make it as effective as as they either do or don't. Do local government employees come to you though and say, you know, hey, we got a problem right here in the city of fill in the blank? Yes. And while they may not be protected in that State Employee Whistleblower Act, we're going to take that information like we would from any other citizen. And uh, it still leads us to a lot of very significant uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there has been an awful lot that has gone on lately. Um, you've been in the, in the news a lot, or your office has been in the news a lot because of so many things happening right here in Seattle. Uh, in particularly in the Seattle Times just from the other day. Uh, the headline is, uh, Struggling Urban League Turns Again to James Kelly. Mm -hmm. And in that article, and in that article there was a discussion about the Urban League and some contracts that they had with uh, the city school, uh, mm -hmm. school board. And we're going to talk about that right after a very short break. We're very fortunate today right here on Public Exposure to have Brian Sontag with us who is the auditor of Washington State, Washington State auditor since 1992. I, I believe that he has been there, there that long. And it's a very interesting office. Probably when the auditor knocks on your door, you're not real happy that he's there. But at the same point in time, uh, he insists that his position is one that actually helps government uh, in, in going forward. And we're going to talk about some of the, the forward-thinking aspect of the Washington State Auditor's Office. In the meantime, go to the website. It's uh, up on the screen. Go to the website. You're going to learn an awful lot more. Okay. So, Mr. Washington State Auditor, the struggling Urban League uh, has turned to James Kelly because mm -hmm. they have some real issues with the Seattle schools and contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a quote out of this article in the Times that's saying, Sontag emphasized that his office audited only the school district, not the Urban League and other vendors. Right. The audit focused on whether the schools could demonstrate that they'd receive value for the money, justifying payment for the vague invoices and overhead is the school's responsibility, Sontag said, not the vendors. Is there, is there a time where you, where you will be asked to audit those who are in contract with governmental entities? Yeah, and, and I suppose we could at times, but especially with uh, 
diminishing dollars and resources on our part, as well as those local governments. That can, that's going to make that uh, much more problematic, much more difficult as we move forward. And I'm not going to ask you to comment specifically on, mm -hmm. on that ongoing matter because it, that that something that I, I already know that you won't be able to talk about. But what is the kind of review that you will do in a circumstance like this where there's mm -hmm. been some questionable spending by mm -hmm. a school system? Well, for instance, in, in this case, uh, and, and you were right in pointing out, we, we did our audit of the Seattle School District, um, not of any of the, the private vendors. Uh, we didn't audit uh, the Urban League, for, for instance, to, to see what they were doing, but to make sure that the, the school district, that public entity, was in, indeed um, being a good steward um, over vast public resources, a lot of public money. Do they have good controls in place? Do they have good monitoring in place uh, to be able to uh, demonstrate to citizens that, that they're taking care of each of those public dollars? And, and let's face it, in a school district too, any dollar that is misspent or misappropriated is a dollar that didn't get to a classroom. Mm -hmm. And, and it, that's very sensitive, and it, and it should be. And these resources are very scarce. And so when we're looking at the school district, we want to make sure that they can demonstrate that they got value um, in that contract. How long do you think that process is going to take place? Oh, <clears throat> in, in this case, we'll probably have a, a final report out within a few weeks. Okay, so we're, we're looking for, um, you know, maybe by the time school starts. Oh, at least by then, yeah. All right, very good. I want to go back to 2006. Mm -hmm. 2006, the headline from the Seattle Times, it's uh, June, no, May the, May the 5th. It says, the state auditor to hunt for ways to protect patients from harm. You remember that? I do. What and, was that all about? Well, in, in fact, uh, the, the Seattle Times back then had uh, quite a lengthy investigative series, and I think they, they titled it uh, License to Harm. But it had to do with uh, the medical profession and, uh, and, and some licensing uh, problems and, and different procedures. The governor actually called and, and asked me if we could get in and take a look in this area and make some recommendations. Well, we made some recommendations to the State Department of Health um, to uh, clean up the licensing, bring in some consistency, some discipline, that had, that had not existed previously. We made other recommendations directly to the legislature. Legislature made some changes in law. Mm -hmm. The State Department of, of Health actually implemented every recommendation we made, and I think we made 30-some recommendations to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a great example. This was not a dollar-saving uh, performance audit. What this was was looking at and identifying some very predatory uh, practices on the part of some medical providers around the state, bringing some controls over that, providing discipline in, in, the, in that area, and seeing some real changes made. So, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you joke and you say, well, you know, we, we do audits. We're not really saving lives. But in this case, I really think we did. So, so that was... That was probably one of the first times you'd ever been asked to proactively make recommendations, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, and like you mentioned before, this was actually on a, a, a specific personal request from the governor to me. Uh, is there something we can do to get involved in this? Can we take a look and help? Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought with that kind of request, uh, we're going to find a way, and we did. All right, so taking that as a background, I want to go to this article in Slate. And just from the other day, it says, this horrible jobs report calls for more spending cuts. And the pull quote from the article is this, employment and government continued to trend down over the, over the month, $39,000 down. Federal employment declined by 14000 in June. Employment in both state and local government continued to trend down over the month and has been falling since the second half of 2008. So with your ability to actually be proactive instead of reporting after the fact, and now when we're in the economic circumstance that government is continually being cut, you probably have a lot of nervous local government and state government people out there, don't you? Oh, I think so. We've got uh, government employees and uh, uh, directors at all levels trying to uh, provide services, meet the needs of, of their communities, and uh, they're doing that with uh, diminishing resources. We're not even in the business anymore of doing more with less. They're all doing less with less. 
but you've got to be about trying to determine what's the best place to be in, how can we continue to provide good public service, meet some of the needs mm -hmm. of the public, and do that in a, in a timely and relevant, efficient way. So are you Washington State's author of the new version of reinventing government? Well, as I said before, I, I think that should always be uh, an effort. I don't, I don't think you reinvent government or a process or procedure and then put it on the shelf. I think it's a con continuous effort. All right, so if you were proactively, if you were act, act, uh, asked proactively uh, on by the state and then by the city because there some, is some involvement to protect the public during the Alaskan Way Viaduct and Seawall Replacement Program, the new tunnel, mm -hmm. what would you do? Well, would I, you be excited about that? Well, yeah, I'm, all, I'm excited about any opportunity to uh, safeguard the public's money and make sure that decisions are being made in an open, um, very transparent way. It's kind of an overused word anymore, but um, overused, but, uh, but, un un but under met. <laughs> there we are, under met. <laughs> uh, and, and I think there's a lot that could be done. Um, you can only go back, you know, so many times and uh, ask and re-ask the question, uh, hoping for a different answer each time, which seems to be what, what some government agencies are trying to do. A decision has been made. We need to move forward on that, whatever that is, mm -hmm. and now account for the public's money properly, like Sound Transit, like this tunnel project, like any of these big, huge uh, public works projects. Um, there's a lot of money involved, but it's the same principle. Would it be in the best interest of government and of the public to bring your office in really early in these huge, massive transportation uh, uh, contracts to make sure that five years down the road, ten years down the road, we're not in lawsuits? I think there's, there's a role for us to play in areas like that. Uh, there's uh, one line that, that we can't cross. We can't uh, we can't advise how to put something in place if we're then going to come along and try to audit that objectively and independently. But we can respond to questions. We can be part of a, of a group that, that does look at things. We can be part of making sure that those transparencies are in place, that the, the kinds of uh, accountability is built in up front. I think there's always going to be room for that, and I think uh, citizens expect it. All right, well, let's go back to Highway 18 then. Sure. If you had been brought in in Highway 18, the Highway 18 contracts really early on in the game, mm -hmm. <clears throat> would you have been able to make recommendations to have saved us, you know, 90 or 55, 60 million dollars? Some amount of money, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, th that whole thing gets back to. Uh, well, there's two guiding principles. One is uh, any of us in public service, remember who you work for and remember whose money it is. And, and I have to believe that people lose sight over whose money it is they're responsible for. If they had some kind of uh, contract or project at their home, I would think that they would be monitoring the expenditure of money, the writing of those checks a little more closely than they were um, over the state's money. That's a big, massive state project. It how, is. Would you, how would you like your office to be used by local government? Local government, uh, call and ask. You know, we, we try to operate with that, uh, that prevention. We always have. We provide hundreds of hours right now of financial management training to local government finance folks um, annually. So what we want is for people to share some of that information. If local governments can uh, actually wind up using us uh, maybe as a, a clearinghouse for local government best practices, whether it be in, in contracting or financial management, whatever that might be. Uh, maybe we can be the folks who can pull some of those best ideas together and share them with other governments. I think that could be a big piece of our prevention. So is that what, next, what is next? First you had financial audit authority, then you had performance audit authority. What's next? Uh, I, th I think having us just exercise those kinds of things and share the information is uh, we don't need additional legislation to do those kinds of things. We just need uh, the cooperation from local governments, the mechanism to do it, and the willingness to learn. So how do you avoid then being, being pulled politically? And, you know, everybody's asking, is going to sure. want to know that. How, you know, how do you keep 
from doing something, you know, in your office from doing something that is not as honest uh, as what we would all like? We've got to stay consistent. We've got to stay true to who we are. I mean, we have, uh, you know, by the book, we have national auditing standards that we have to adhere to. Uh, if we start to uh, look at those as something gray instead of black and white, that can get us into trouble. If we start uh, uh, coming up with different auditing schedules based on you know, who doesn't want an audit to come out because a certain election is coming up on the ballot soon. It could be a school district election, mm -hmm. a city or a county election with individuals on the ballot. We just can't get into those kinds of things. And so we're not going to start saying yes to any of them. We've got about a minute left, and I wanted to ask this. In the past, we've had you on the show, and you've talked an awful lot about the Port of Seattle. And that's mm -hmm. several years in the past now. Yeah. Um, it worked, didn't it? You bet it did. Um, we did a performance out at the Port of Seattle, uh, quite a bit of pushback. Uh, yeah, we read about that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we fast forward that. They have implemented so many of the changes that were recommended. It's a completely different environment there. Uh, port administration and the elected port commissioners work differently together. We talk about openness and transparency. They've got it there. Hmm. Very good. Um, if there was an, a, a single piece of advice that you would like to give to a citizen out there, not a state employee mm -hmm. or a government employee, but to a citizen who says, look, there's something I really got to get to Mr. Sontag. Mm -hmm. I have to get it to the state auditor's office. How would, what would advice would you tell them? Well, the website's been uh, on the screen. Our phone number is uh, easy to find. Uh, email us. You can do that right through that website as well. Get us the information. At, at the very least, we're going to take a look at it and make sure we understand what that issue is. Okay. With that, we're going to let that be the last word. Brian Sontag, thank you very much. Thanks, that again, has been Brian Sontag, Washington State Auditor. Go to the website. It's up on the screen. You're going to learn an awful lot, even if you don't have anything to report. We'll see you right here next week on Public Exposure. Take care.